this year's pageant. It's been organised by a different uh, lot of members of the, uh, the West Show Committee, especially Lisa Tempest. Uh, one or two of the old brigade, like myself, have been uh, asked to help this year, which we've been very willing to do so. Before we start, I think everybody's assembled and will be coming across very shortly. I can see some of the vehicles assembling at the top of the arena, ready to start. While we're waiting, I'd like to give you a brief history of the uh, Guernsey tomato industry. It really started way back in the 1860s, when an article appeared in 1864 in one of the uh, English newspapers saying that the tomato, not only was it very edible, but it was also very good for your health. And this article also appeared in one of the Guernsey newspapers, and by 1865, some growers were already sending tomatoes to England. So the Guernsey grower jumped on the bandwagon there very, very quickly. Of course, they had um, lots of greenhouses here anyway, mostly lean-tos. That's a, a, lean, a greenhouse leaning against a stone wall. And in that, they grew absolutely fantastic grapes. So the first growers hedged their bets and grew their tomatoes under the grapes. So they had the best of both worlds. But very soon, people were actually building greenhouses specifically for growing tomatoes. They were called, we call them in Guernsey spans because they would be two walls and the greenhouse would span across the two walls. The one you can see here that we've got on uh, f for our um, pageant, this at the wooden end, some of them would have had a glass end, but we think that the wooden ones, it was probably actually cheaper to make a greenhouse with a wooden gable than it was to glaze it. The growers carry on growing their tomatoes in the soil, but very soon it was found that the soil got sick, as they called it. They did know a great deal about uh, diseases or funguses and things like that that would affect the tomato. And so he, they went to great lengths to put in new soil in their greenhouses. They'd actually empty the whole of the greenhouse out with wheelbarrows. And then they'd bring in fresh soil from a field which they'd taken the turf off, return the soil from the greenhouse to the field. So they would empty the greenhouse with wheelbarrows and that soil would go in the field and the fresh soil from the field would go into the greenhouse. And then somebody invented steaming. That is actually steaming the soil to kill all the bugs and the diseases in the soil. Mr. Pote and Mr. Dorry in the early uh, 1900s invented a, stoil, a soil sterilizing machine whereby you again had to empty the soil out of the greenhouse and tip it into a great big sort of tin, about 15 foot long by 10 foot wide, which had spikes coming out of it. The spikes had little holes. Below that there was a boiler which produced steam. The steam would come up through the pipes and out of the little holes and steam the soil. And then the soil would then have to be emptied out of the, uh, out of the steriliser and carted back into the greenhouse. So a very laborious job. Later on, when uh, coal-fired boilers and then oil-fired boilers came into production. They used grids. These were long pipes which were buried in the soil and attached to hoses and the hoses ran back to the boiler that was producing the steam. And this really stopped all the problems of uh, bugs and fungus and other diseases in the soil. And it's, there's still one person who's using that today. I think the people who grow the herbs still sterilize their soil in the same way. The first tomatoes were shipped to England in wicker baskets. The first wicker baskets were quite large and they could hold possibly up to 16 or 17 pounds of tomatoes. The 
a, new, uh, a piece of brown paper was put on the top of them and then some string was laced across the top to hold the brown paper down. This was fine until they got to the harbour when they loaded the boats because they would slide the wicker basket down a plank and if the person at the bottom didn't catch it, all the tomatoes would spill out all over the bottom of the boat in the hold. So they then put a wicker lids on which had a slit which went over the handle and these were tied on at both ends with a piece of twine. Then a destination label was attached and on that you'd have the grower's name or number and the weight that was in the basket. It wasn't very long before some of the markets in England were complaining about Guernsey growers because what they didn't realise was that when you transport the tomatoes, they do lose weight through transpiration. So on the label they might have put that they had 16 pounds of tomatoes in there, but when they got to England, there was only 14 and a half pounds of tomatoes. And they thought that the uh, Guernsey growers were trying to diddle them. They also complained about, uh, when they started um, grading the tomatoes, we think they graded them into two grades, into smooths, which were the very best tomatoes, and ordinaries, which were the lower grade. And some of the markets were complaining that some, some Guernsey growers were putting roughs at the bottom of the basket, smooths on the top, and calling the whole basket a basket of smooths. So this did cause a, quite a bit of trouble. But it wasn't until 1933 that actually grading happened by law. And um, they set up a certain number of grades. And this continued, well, right up until the end of the, the growing industry, which was in the sort of 80s or 90s, I suppose. There wasn't very much going on. Today in the 1950s, we're talking 1954 for this pageant. It's a year after the, Guern the Guernsey Tomato Marketing Board was formed. And before that, a, a grower could send his tomatoes to whichever market he wanted to. It could be to London, Newcastle, it could go even up into Scotland. But what happened was that if there was news that last week London was giving a good price for tomatoes, everybody would send their tomatoes to London and there would be none in Glasgow or in Birmingham or Cardiff. And so with the, uh, the coming of the Guernsey Tomato Marketing Board, the, um, all the tomatoes had to go through the board and they were shipped to all the different markets and then the people, uh, the growers would then get a share of the sort of average price for all the tomatoes. They had a special chip that was produced with the Isle of Sun logo on it. And there must have been millions and millions and millions of these chips. In fact, the record, I think, number of chips that went over to England was in 1969. And if you work out, roughly, if there were sort of six tomatoes to the pound, over 700 million tomatoes were sent out in that year, in one year. Seven billion tomatoes. So can you imagine every single one of those was hand-picked, packed, shipped to England. An absolutely fantastic thought that that many tomatoes could have been sent in one year. The grading that we're going to see today, we have about six grades, I think. There were the pinks, which were the largest decent fruit. Then we had the pink and whites, which were slightly smaller, but they were classed as the best fruit, the pink and whites. Now they were called pink and whites because they were packed in pink and white tissue paper that was put in the chip. The pinks obviously were in pink paper, then we had yellow, that was the next grade, they were in yellow paper, and then we had the greens and the whites, oh, the blues, then the greens and the whites. Now, the greens and the whites were sort of slightly out of shape, but probably the best tasting. And then we had the small ones. They also had stamps to indicate what type of tomato it was. 
we had a, a sunrise for the best tomatoes. Then we had a star for the next grade. Then we had the, um, the circle and we had a square and we had a triangle for the others. And for the very small ones, it was a little circle of dots. I can see that the, the people are beginning to assemble at the top of the arena. They should be making their way down now to buy the old grey commentary box. Please, if you'd like, you make your way down to the old commentary box, please. Right, I think we're just about ready to go with the pageant. This is Growing Tomatoes in 1954. As I said, one year after the Guernsey Tomato Marketing Board started. Here you're at Mr. Tostevin's Vinery. On the left we have one of his greenhouses. Next to it, with the chimney, is the boiler house. Then we have a smaller greenhouse. That's where he propagates all his uh, tomatoes for the following year. Then we've got a little shed. Alongside that we have the packing shed. And at the far end we've got the um, missing... <laughs> We've got Mrs. Tostevin and Mr. Tostevin's house. Now the first to arrive in the arena is the Stoker. That's Bert Fallais. It's, he's the first one usually to arrive before all the workers, but they seem to have arrived early this morning. I'm not quite sure why they've already arrived, but there you go. So Bert's the Stoker. He looks after the boiler. He looks after uh, making sure that all the clinker that would form is taken out and then he would stoke it with more coal. And uh, I've got a friend here who's doing some commentary with me and that's Ron and he's going to um, tell you all about the Welsh coal that came into Guernsey. Yeah, many years ago the Dorish coal boats used to bring the coal in from Swansea, anthracite coal. And it was a very big uh, industry um, that was here in Guernsey with the tomato growing. Obviously you don't see so many greenhouses around the island today, but in the 50s and 60s it was big business in our island. It was the, probably the main industry at that time. And many, many years, for many years the, the coal boats used to bring the coal in um, and unload at St. Samson's Harbour and it was taken by lorry to the various coal yards that were in the island and then it would be taken out to the vineries as and when it was needed to stoke these boilers that were everywhere around and you'd probably get five or six tonnes of coal delivered at any one time and that would probably last about a month and this was important especially when you were growing seedlings you had to keep the greenhouses warm and in the cold months that would follow from February, March, April time. You usually had the greenhouses heated. And so that was one of the things. Um, but many people were in, involved in this industry that sadly has all but disappeared in the island now. So um, the other thing I want to just comment on quickly is Peter Brow's fantastic knowledge that he's given in that preamble to start in the pageant. Well done, Peter. That was very good. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we've got the, uh, the... I think this is the carpenter arriving. Have you got your ruler with you? We should have some workers coming in on the lorry in a minute. Oh, you look. Here they come. Now, this is uh, a lovely Morris vehicle that uh, belongs to Mr. Richard Yeom from the o Occupation Museum. It's dressed up as the H.W. Luray. Now, Mr. Tostevin, who owns this winery, he really thinks a lot of himself, and he wants everybody to think that he's sending a lot of tomatoes. So he's had all these, as you can see on the side, they're imitation chips painted on the side so that everybody thinks 
that he's uh, growing a lot of tomatoes, but in fact, as you can see, they're only photographed on a sort of canvas. But they're bringing in some of the more of the workers, and they're just directing the lorry to reverse into the right place. Some children over there are already um, beginning to put tomatoes in paper bags. I think they're doing this for a charity, and they're being supervised by Angela, Angela Degari, who always helps with the pageant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you must realise that we never have any rehearsals for this, so all this is happening now with no rehearsals at all, and sometimes it looks like it as well, but never mind. <laughs> so here are some of the workers that... Uh, Mr. Tostevin has been to pick up, um, and we've got the foreman, that's Richard Yeo, he's in those orange trousers, and he's the foreman, so he's making sure everybody's unloaded safely, and they'll be starting to go and pick tomatoes and start grading them, ready to be shipped out to England. Now the chips already were made in Guernsey, the wood came already pre-cut from Spain and would be unloaded down in St. Peterport and then transported to the box factories. And Ron knows a bit about the box factories, so I'll pass the microphone over to him. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, the box factories in Guernsey, there were several of them. Um, names like Gilbert's Box Factory in Collins Road. There was Norman's Box Factory. They were at the Cash at St. Martin's. Um, there was Horman's Box Factory. There were several of these box factories dotted around the island that used to supply all the growers, um, and they used to go through quite a lot. The, the chip baskets were uh, the first ones, and then they went on to the little uh, square ones much later. And the chip baskets were all made on machines, and people used to spend a lot of time making thousands of chip baskets. And there were two designs that I remember. One had the the aluminium handle that went across the middle and the earlier ones had the wooden handles and you can see the ones being used today are the wooden handle chips as we call them so that was a, a big thing that used to happen uh, from the box factories now the process for grading tomatoes is fairly simple they've got a draw grader over there it's quite a modern thing for 1954 Basically, it's uh, a series of drawers, one above the other. There's quite a large number of holes drilled in each of the drawers, and these represent the size of the tomatoes for that grade. So the bigger ones stay in the top drawer, and then the, the smaller ones fall through, and so on, and the, till the smallest ones are at the bottom. Then the tomatoes, all the rotten ones, or bruised ones, or... Uh, those that aren't the right colour are taken out as well, and then they're put in the chip baskets. Now before that, the chip has to be weighed. If you remember, I told you about transpiration, about the tomatoes losing weight. So they had to make sure that the right number of, uh, of tomatoes were in the basket, the right weight. So they weighed the, ch the chip first, so that when they were weighed finally at the end, they would have the vineries, well all the vineries were on a good flat site, so that was fine, and they would load up a few chips into the back, which I hope they've already picked and put in, or will put in, and then they'll take them to the packing shed. Now, as I said, they, they graded the tomatoes, put them in the correct chips with the correct paper, and then they would go back and be weighed and make sure there was the correct amount of, in, the, in the chip, and then two chip planks would be nailed on the top, and then they would be put in the back of the lorry and they would be then taken down to the White Rock where they would be inspected to make sure that what was in the basket was correct. There was an inspector down there and he'd take, say, half a dozen chips off a load of, and then he'd empty, take the chip planks off, empty it out into a tray and make sure that all the tomatoes in that were of the correct grade. I think they're now loading the tomatoes that they've picked into the Wrigley and they'll be taking that very soon to the packing shed. It's very busy in the packing shed. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, activity go on, going on in there. 
As you can see, there's somebody nailing the, um, the planks onto the top of the chip baskets. They would have had a stamp put on the end. And then, as I said, they would be picked up by the, or Mr. Tostevin's lorry and taken to the harbour to be shipped over to England. They went to, uh, the tomatoes went to quite a few different harbours. They definitely went to Southampton and Portsmouth, and they even went to Shoreham. They went to Weymouth as well. So there was a great industry. It seems as if they're running out of chips. Um, I, think, I think Lloyd's having a chat to the foreman there and telling him, look, we're going to run out of chips. You better send the lorry to get some more because uh, we're never going to finish today's picking with the chips that we've got. So Mr. Herb's going over to, his, to the lorry driver and sending him off to Mr. Tostevin's other binary just down the road. And then they'll go and get some more chips and they can carry on. Have you got any chips left, Lloyd? Uh, I think they're running out of chips. Yeah, the lorry's gone to get some more chips. I don't know where this other winery is, but... And the painter there, uh, the, the carpenter, he's painting the door. The carpenters always used to seem to have these bib and brace... Uh, set up and a beret which could be worn at any sort of angle really you could have it pointing forward so you could have it jauntily to one side or pushed back and I can remember lots of uh, people when I was a youngster with berets and they had them on all different uh, angles here's the little Wrigley truck coming past again most of them had Villiers engines and I was told that some of them had Petter engines as well and much later on they had uh, Honda engines, but this one has got a, uh, a, a Villiers engine in it. Uh, the lorry's back. I think, Lloyd, you ought to call for lunch now, I think. I think it's lunch break. You haven't got any chips left. All those people in the greenhouse, it's lunch now. Lunch. Run. The do run run. You can tell the people all about a Guernsey lunch, can't you? Well, we can, we can certainly say something about lunch in Guernsey. I mean, it was a tradition. It, was, it wasn't just part of what happened. It was a tradition that you stopped for a cup of tea, or as we all called it, lunch. And that was something that usually happened in the morning and in the afternoon. Yeah, usually about half nine, quarter to ten, you'd stop for a cup of tea. And if it'd be a bit longer than a quarter of an hour if the foreman wasn't around, if you could get away with it. And most people tried and do that. We always thought the worst thing to do was stand up quick if the foreman came in, because he'd think you'd been stopped for ages. <laughs> but it, it was one of the traditions. You always had a nice cup of tea. And in the afternoon? In the afternoon, the same thing. And if you were really lucky, you might get a bit of cake in the afternoon from the wife of the binary owner would make it. And there we are, look, there's some cake being done already. Guernsey, gosh. Oh, perfect. Butter done the right side. <laughs> As you can see, this was a very labour-intensive job. So it was a big crowd that stopped for a cup of tea. Oh, here's the tractor coming. Well, I can hear a tractor coming into the arena with a trailer. I'm not quite sure what's going on. I think it's Mr. Tostevin coming. I don't know if he's come to check up on his workers or what. What's he done? He's done a, bought a David Brown crop master and a trailer. He was supposed to be going to the Lashes to buy a car for his family. And what's he done? He's gone and bought a David Brown crop master, second hand mind you, and a second hand trailer. And you know the reason why? They don't make a car big enough for his family. You'll be seeing later on that why he has got a tractor and a trailer for his family. 
So all the men are coming around to have a look, and some of the women are going to have a look at this new tractor he's bought. Well, I wouldn't say it's new, would you, Crunch? No, no, it's seen better days. It's a good second hand or third hand, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. So we're all having a look at that, having a chat to Mr. Tostavid. Why have you bought this wreck? So he's explaining that all the children can go in the back, you see. Even the foreman's coming to have a look. He says it's got two seats, you see. The cop master would have a double seat. So he's saying that he can uh, go, uh, he can put his wife on the front seat with him and all the children in the back. Hello, 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 Ron. Oh, what's going on here? What's happening in the boiler house, we wonder? Did you... Did you see that, ladies and gentlemen, or not? Did you see Mr. Tostavid disappear into the boiler house with a couple of ladies, in inverted commas? Uh-oh, oh, Lloyd's blown the whistle. Everybody's back to work. So everybody's going back to work now. The women seem to be going into the greenhouse to, uh, uh, Bert, Bert, Mr. Fallows, I wouldn't go in the boiler house if I were you at the moment. You might get the shock of your... Oh, what is going on in the boiler house? Blimey, this didn't used to happen at the West Show. But I wouldn't go in there if I were you, mate. It'll give you a heart attack. We know you're 87, you know. We want you to last a few more. Oh. No. You get the sack, you will. You really will get the sack. Hello, hello, hello. What's happening now? I think we've got a little green van coming into the arena. You've never seen them like that before, eh, Bert? Me, are you gosh, it, real or... Huh? <laughs> Hello, uh, yes, Tobble, Ron. Oh, yes, Tobble. Here's the inspector coming for the tomatoes. Uh, it's Mr. Lene arriving. He's the inspector from the Guernsey Tomato Marketing Board. He's one of the inspectors that uh, stand at the White Rock. I'm not quite sure what the trouble is. I think he's going to have to have a word with Richard about what's going on with his tomato packing. Oh, and he seems friendly. Anyway, he's shaking hands with Richard, and uh, he's telling Richard that since they've been using the draw grader, his packing hasn't been very good. That there's something amiss. His tomatoes... Uh, uh, not quite graded correctly. So he's going to have a look at the grader. If, those, if the people around the grader could move out the way and make room for the inspector, please. He's having a look. He's got a... He's having a good look at it anyway. They always had a white coat, the inspectors, didn't they? They made it more important, you see. It was a position of authority, the inspector. So he's got to have a good look, and everybody knows it's him, because he's the one in the white coat. <laughs> I think he's going to measure the size of the holes. Uh, I think there's something wrong with the size. He's measured the holes, and uh, they seem to be too small. He's called the carpenter over who made it, and they're having a look. And he says, well, I'm using my great-great-grandfather's ruler. And when he takes it out, what do they notice? The end, the brass end has fallen off his ruler. And so everything he's been measuring is a quarter of an inch too small. So that all the trouble that these people go to to grow the tomatoes and then grading them, what's happened? The carpenters made the draw grader far too small. All the holes are too small. It's sending them away.
I'd like you to throw a few tomatoes at him, you know. But not... Because I think he deserves it. <laughs> and don't hit my phone! <laughs> Oh, I think that might be enough because they're reaching the audience over here. Right, I think you better get out of the way, uh, the inspector. It's not your fault, mate. Right. I don't know where Mrs. Tempest, uh, Mrs. Tostavid is. So you better not use that draw grader anymore, folks. Uh, oh yeah. uh, the draw blade is now out of action. You're going to have to start blading the tomatoes by hand, I'm afraid. Now, here's Mrs. Tostavin arriving. She must have taken her kids to the beach or something. Blimey! How many has she got, Ron? Can you count them for me? There must be a dozen there, Peter. There's got to be a dozen. Look. Three, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's thirteen. Thirteen. Kids of bakers, dozen. No, but there's, there's one in the pram as well, and looks like she's pregnant. She hasn't got a television out this way, has she? I don't think so. You know, if somebody could invent a pill that would stop women getting pregnant, I'm sure they could make a lot of money, you know. Look at them. Now, Mrs. Tossavin. Can you see what your husband's bought you? But we don't know where he is. We haven't seen him for a long while. Has anybody seen Mr. Tostavid anywhere? No, no, nobody's seen Even the stoker hasn't seen him. He's in the boiler house. Oh, no, he's not. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, no, he's not. Oh, yes, he is. Hello, I think. Are you clear? Are you clear? On the lap of I, oh Chebo. Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! I'm not quite sure what's going on behind there, but I wouldn't like to... Oh! oh that hurts. <laughs> well, I um, certainly deserve that. Uh, the Stoke is now handing Mrs. Uh, Tostov in the unmentionables. Oh, look. Uh oh, oh, hang on, hang on. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, I think. I think you're right. How many of these little children have got a flat cap on, eh? <laughs> uh, he's going to take her in the tractor, look. That's it. Come on, get her in. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> uh, look, look, we don't, we don't want a baby on the... Uh, on the showground, thank you. And all the children are going into the uh, trailer. Limey. Is there room for Mrs. Tostavid in the trailer? Yeah, she can't climb over the tailboard. Now open it up, that's it. That's it, help her in. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you just wonder how many of those children are actually Mr. Tostovitz, don't you? <laughs> you know? I mean, that's a... I don't think all... I think there must be some French children in there. They must be. They can't be all from Mr. Tostovitz. There's not enough days in the air for all that lot. <laughs> <laughs> they must be twins and triplets, eh? There's got to be, Peter. There's no doubt. There's got to be something there. Definitely. Yeah. Mind you, it did happen, eh? I mean, my grand, my uh, great-grandmother had 22 children, 14 of which survived. And I think that's what happened in those days. And not in the 50s, but certainly in sort of, you know, in the pre-1900s. Uh, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. I think all the children would better sit down so that they're safe. 
when the tractor goes out because we don't want anybody falling out. I think the ambulance is already occupied with the, uh, the lawnmower racing. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. There they go. Give them a big round of applause. Oh, no! And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our pageant for this year. We hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, it's, it's different to what we've done in the past, but I hope you've enjoyed it as much, and I hope you've learned a little bit about the Guernsey tomato industry. I'd like to thank Ron for helping me here uh, on the commentary. It's been like Anton Deck this afternoon, really. The Anton Deck of the West Show. Anyway, thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you'd like to go in at the arena and take some photographs, you can do, and then we'll have to uh, uh, then clear up, get the vehicles out for the next, uh, well, the next attraction in the main arena. Thank you again, and thank you, Ron. Let's have a big hand for Peter Breyer, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic knowledge of what he put together here this afternoon with everybody else doing the pageant. Absolutely brilliant. Good, good West Show. Fun.